This is the movie that oil companies don't want you to see. This is the movie that the coal lobby doesn't want you to see. Right. I'm of the opinion that we are so into driving our cars that we'll use ourselves as fuel rather than giving up driving. Mm. If you look at the algae step, what's happening is we're taking a 150 million year process and we're compressing it down to a few days. From the famous Acme Theater in Hollywood, it's the Gregory Mantel Show. Today, how can we reduce our dependence on oil? Is biofuel the answer to environmental issues or is it part of the problem? I'm joined by actor and environmental activist Peter Fonda, as well as Josh Tekel, director of the documentary Fuel. They both have a lot to say about the future of our environment. Great to have you here today. Thank you for having us, Peter, Gregory. Pleasure. Thanks, Gregory. Well, you know, before I watched your documentary, I assumed that it would be a big deal to reconfigure our car industry. But basically, you're saying drive diesel cars and use biodiesel fuel? Is it? It comes down to that? It could be that easy? It could be that easy. Of course, you know, today with Detroit in the situation that we see it in, you know, there's a lot more that we need to do than just drive diesel cars. Yes. You know, we're looking at an auto industry that it's basically, you know, for lack of better wording, it's been kind of screwing the American people for the last, oh, I don't know, almost 100 years. We're seeing cars in the U.S., they get about 25 miles per gallon. That's about the same as the Model T got. Well, it's interesting, though, you say in the documentary that Henry... Henry Fonda, <laughs> Henry Ford. See, it's the family thing. You know, what could I say? Yeah. John Ford was in there too, so it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it works, Gregory. Right, right work. He started out with ethanol cars, so in the early Ford cars, the Model T, and then, but how did we end up on gasoline? Ah, Rockefeller. <laughs> ah, JD. So yes. it, that really was the point behind prohibition, is what a lot of people say, was to get rid of. Can you beat that? That the reason, because the manufacture of alcohol, all f ways of doing it was called illegal on the, is it Fulstead Act? Mm -hmm. right. And, and right. um, basically, Mr. Rockefeller wrote the act. And that meant that Ford is out there with his ethanol cars and making ethanol from uh, corn grain. That's alcohol. He got busted. He hung on for 12 years. And as soon as he gave up, guess what disappeared? Prohibition. Mm. Interesting. So they started out trying to do the right thing or what would be a good thing today, mm. but where are we today? You were saying some of the changes. I mean, obviously, really, the, the industry's a mess. I mean, what can you say? I mean, it's just falling mm. to pieces. So, but I guess they kind of got themselves into it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. One of the things we really explore in fuel is this, how did we get here? You know, how did this sort of disintegration of the great American auto industry take place? And we see, yeah, Ford was a visionary. Rudolf Diesel was a visionary. Lo and behold, Diesel was found face down floating in the English Channel. So you kind of implied that there may have been questionable circumstances around his death. I mean, you think it wasn't suicide, I guess, as is commonly accepted. Do you think it may have been more than that? It was extremely questionable, extremely questionable. And, and even with the movie today, even with Fuel, we continue to see questionable circumstances, you know, preventing this movie from really going to the masses where it should be. Uh, part of the biofuels backlash, you know, this huge anti-biofuels, right. you know, media expose that we saw last year. It was right after oil prices hit $148 a barrel. People needed an enemy. But it was also after the former version of this movie called Fields of Fuel won Sundance. 48 hours after this movie won Sundance, boom, the anti-biofuels backlash was in the media. Well, since you referred to it, I read, um, for instance, the Time Magazine article, uh, right. the, the myth behind uh, about you know clean fuels. Mm. Um, so the argument is that biofuels, if you look at the whole scheme of things, really aren't any better because what, it's causing deforestation of the Amazon, um, taking food away from hungry kids. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty heavy accusation. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what do you say to that? Well, I, I say what's causing deforestation in the Amazon and in Malaysia is deforestation in Amazon mm -hmm. and in Malaysia. So there's this, there's this desire to say, well, it's a very simple relationship. It's a causal relationship. People wanted biofuels in America. We, ch we chopped down the rainforest. Not so simple. The reason that the biofuels were proliferating in Brazil is because they had to grow more soybeans. Mm -hmm. The primary part of the soybean is the meal. It's 80%. That meal is not fed to humans. It's fed to cattle. So here we have this booming cattle industry in Brazil because of mad cow disease. And they're exporting, exporting. Their exports grew almost 100% in less than five years. So it's, a, it's gone from a niche industry to a major national industry. They clear more rainforest to grow more soybeans, to have more cattle, and all of a sudden, what's left over? Soybean oil. So what are they doing? They're making biodiesel. 
Malaysia is kind of a different situation in that one tree, one tree chopped down and delivered as wood is, more, is worth more money than the average Malaysian person will make in a year. Mm. So there's a huge motivation there for tea. But isn't there other wood. land in the world where this stuff could be grown? Absolutely. We could grow it in the desert. But it's just too expensive or? I guess mm, not really. No. No, it, the water, wastewater. We have lots of that. This is probably something we do more than anything else in the world is we create waste. <laughs> you know? Well, and your veg, you have your veggie van. Mm -hmm. you, it, it drives on what? Um, waste used vegetable, used cooking oil. Cooking you know, oil. So funny, this morning I was on the phone with the guys who run 35,000 stores. Yeah. All of the Taco Bells, the Long John Silvers, the KFCs. These are guys who, I mean, they. you want to talk about making a lot of waste cooking oil? These guys make a lot of waste yeah. cooking oil, right? Number one question they had is, how can we make this into biodiesel? We're so stoked. Took them a little while to come around, but they are coming. So, it, and that's clean when you burn it. I mean, that's not. It's not perfect. Not you know, perfect. I don't want to give the impression that this is the, the ultimate you know, silver bullet solution. Peter, Peter has a hydrogen car. Now, right, out right. of the tailpipe of that, it's perfectly clean. Water vapor. Yeah, now tell me about this hydrogen car, because I've heard you know, that people thought about that in the past, but they were afraid the cars would blow up. So you're here, so that's a good yeah, sign. <laughs> you made it today. I made it today. Uh, this is by GM, and they've been in this uh, whole thing for about 40 years. People just don't know about it. We've all been trying to figure out, or, or those people in, in auto world have been trying to figure out how to get more efficient and do things, because they're getting a big ax from the rest of us environmentalists, are just all over them. Uh, so they've been doing it for a while, and they perfected the, uh, the unit. They need to perfect the infrastructure. They say they're going to have a hydrogen highway from uh, LA or San Diego all the way up to uh, Vancouver, where the games are going to be, the Olympics. Well, what's a hydrogen this. highway? Is that like service no, no, there was, there'll be enough service stations to keep your hydrogen car fueled. But, you know, mind you, that's a, a prototype thing, although hydrogen is, is a, the most abundant, abundant element in the whole universe, you still have to get it somehow. And this somehow is by electricity. So right. until we can make the electricity, and you know, clean coal, the myth, you were talking about some myths, there's a real myth, the clean coal oh, industry. Boy, this is an oxymoron, dude. Right. If you don't believe me, go pick up a piece of coal up, check it out, and grab it, look out the other side, and then put it down and check out your hands. Right. Well, and that's part of the problem They're sometimes, not clean. too, people will say, you know, with electric cars, because right. again, you know, you think, oh, that's great, it's electric, but then, you know, where do you get the electricity from? You get it from the coal plant or the nuclear plant, and those both have issues with it. Mm -hmm. But do you think there are ways of addressing those kinds of concerns? That Absolutely. I think that you've got to look at the, you've, you've got to look at this as a transitionary period that we're in. You know, ethanol was the first stab at the transition, but it turns out that it takes almost as much energy to make a gallon of ethanol as you get out. So, well, we tried, right? Biodiesel, that's the next step. Take waste vegetable oil, one unit of energy in, three units of energy out. Okay, now we're moving in the right direction. Now you start looking at advanced technologies yeah. like algae in the desert, using sewage as the primary resource. Algae is the converter of the resource into a fuel. Now you're putting one unit in and you're getting 10 units of energy out. We'll pick up on them in just a second. We'll be right back with Peter Fonda and Josh Tekel right after this. Thank you for the waiting, may I pay your order, please? Can I get a medium Sprite and uh, all your used cooking oil, please? What do you mean? You know the used frying oil that you fry things in? The used what? All right, what can I get you? I, you know, you guys use used frying oil, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just wondered if I could get all of that. All of it? Yeah. Well, I really don't know about that. And we are back with Josh Dekel, director of the Documentary Fuel, and actor Peter Fonda. So tell me about the algae. You can actually, well, we can... Let me, let me interrupt before he yeah. launches, because he knows about it a lot more than I do. Uh, if you recall the start of the movie, we start on a shot probably from the space station or a shuttle off the Earth. And Josh is talking about what the Earth was, covered totally with water, and it was. And uh, the living organisms, which are our ancestors, are diatoms, photoplankton, algae. They all died, sank to the bottom of the ocean, got covered with silt and sand, pressure came in, hence, you know, and I always thought, dang, 
did they have that many of those big lizards that they can make this much gasoline? Because <laughs> it never made sense to me as a kid. And then I realized, wow, sure. First thing out of the, what, 150 years, 57 years ago? 150 million years. No, no, when we started pumping. Oh, yeah, 150, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 150, yeah. 150, and uh, we are starting to pump the algae out as oil. This is back when we first started. And in the film, there's a moment that Josh has uh, this, this epiphany of maybe it's not right, right, which we were just talking about. Maybe what I'm doing is causing harm. Maybe it was I wrong about my whole thing. It's great to take that epiphany with him. And then at the end, you find out what that was at the beginning. At the end, is the answer is like, wow. You know, people have said, we're, we're trained to always answer a question. I try to reverse the process. No, no, don't look for the answer. Just slow it way down. Understand the question. The moment you understand the question, the answer is inherent. This is my little well, I'm waiting to hear the answer. <laughs> so the answer is the algae. Is the, that answer, right? the, the algae will take the clean oil, <laughs> the clean coal stuff out of the stack. You can feed it right down the algae. Love that one. That's big time dessert. That's a chocolate volcano for them. They just eat that right up. Seriously. Yeah. And there's, there are funguses that will do that too. Clean up messes. There's all kinds of things that are things. But right now, I'm of the opinion that. We are so into driving our cars that we'll use ourselves as fuel rather than giving up driving. Mm. That's a, a heavy statement to make. Here in LA, it's <laughs> but for sure. LA, yeah, really. Uh, and yeah. Josh has a way that's com become positive, where rather than all of us going out of the th th theater thinking, dang, everything's melting, you know. <laughs> There's the a tendency in sometimes. truth, yeah. you know. And it's a bummer. A film I saw before I saw Josh's film called Flow, mm. all caps, F-L-O-W, for love of water. So scary, privatization of water in the world. Then I got to Josh's film, and I'm watching it, just blown away by the information, really well done, and then this epiphany, and I thought, right, I remember all that stuff. And he comes back with twice as many uh, possible answers to the question. Well, so now going back to the algae that he was talking about, mm. um, you can put it next to coal-powered plants, though, and they can actually, because what I thought was interesting is you have all these different approaches and alternate energy, yeah. but then toward the end, you kind of talk about the way that even if we didn't change certain things like coal-powered plants, or, 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 I mean, you could stick with some of the things, but make adjustments that would, for instance, coal-powered plants, you could use algae. How can you use algae with those, too? If you look at where we are today and where we're going, you kind of have to draw an arc. You know, we're not going to just be here in this fossil fuel-powered world snap our fingers and be in George Jetson land or Star Trek land, there's going to have to be a transition, steps to get there. So one of the things we know from the movie Fuel is what Peter Fonda said. All of the oil on the planet actually comes from algae. Grew about 150 million years ago, was covered, as you said, and then turned into oil. It was a process. So today, if you look at those steps, and I said ethanol, biodiesel, algae is another step forward. If you look at the algae step, what's happening is we're taking a 150 million year process and we're compressing it down to a few days. Mm -hmm. A few and days. Making fuel with the algae. So the algae take the hydrogen out of the water, they take the carbon out of the air, and they make hydrocarbons, which is oil. So algae produce oil. If you've ever slipped on a brick pathway in the summertime even, that's that glaze of algae on the, on the pathway. So that's what they're calling bio oil, is that it? No, or, that's, you know, bio oil has a, it's a, it's a big definition with all biological sources of oil. Hmm. This is specifically algal oil. Oh. One of the things which you mentioned, Peter, which is just so cool, is okay, part of that transition is getting away from things like coal. There's no clean coal, that's total BS. But there are ways to transition out of coal, and one of those ways is to take the carbon dioxide and filter it through an algae farm. Algae love carbon dioxide, so they're going to grow much faster. So we can actually, instead of just emitting that stuff into the air or putting it in the ground and pretending that it's sequestered, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> we can actually use it to hypergrow algae, and that can be a fuel source. So we're not getting rid of the CO2. We're still going to emit it when we burn the algae, but we get one more life cycle out of it. We're getting another use. So these are transitionary technologies until maybe we can get to the hydrogen, yeah. until maybe we can get to the fully clean grid of wind turbines and solar panels. I think the future of personal transportation 
is vehicles that don't use liquid fuels. Absolutely. I think we'll I think we'll evolve away from liquid fuels completely. But we're here today, and we've got to begin that process. One thing that I think is interesting, and you kind of alluded to it with even some of the fast food restaurants, is that you know, despite whatever backlash or questions there may have been about biofuels after some of the recent articles and things, um, in general, though, it really seems like you know this is becoming fashionable. I mean, it's going green in America. You know, mm. you even have big companies that. You know, instead of, I hate to say it, you know, we all, there's a tendency to think of evil corporate America or maybe the case of the oil companies or the car companies, right. but big companies, we're almost becoming European in the sense where, as you mentioned, I know you were influenced by Germany a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is, this is becoming more mainstream, you know, certain aspects at least of going green. Have you noticed that and, you know, where do you think that that's, how that's, is that going to play into this? It's interesting, you know, I was just in uh, Denver this past weekend where we released Fuel, we released the movie in Denver, and Denver is such an eco-hip city. Yeah. I mean, everyone is riding their bikes, everyone has got their water bottle. Right. Like, you wouldn't be caught dead in a Hummer in Denver. <laughs> you just or, or you would be. You, that's, that's the only, that's that's the only way yeah. you'd be in a Hummer. It's, it's just cool <laughs> to be eco, and that's, the, you know, people are riding their bikes to the movie theater, even in cold, windy nights. It's just what you do in Denver. You, you don't pollute. It's just not part of the mentality. So I think, you know, we've got little enclaves started where people are kind of holding on. They're being like, you're not going to take my eco away, you know, and that becomes cool. And so it's kind of still cultish, but we're moving into the trend. It looks good to be eco, but to really be eco, I think that's still a bit fringe, you know? Well, now what do you say to, um, you know, I've heard a lot back when I was talking to somebody about the show that we were doing today, they said, well, you know, the, the big oil companies are investing a lot in alternate energy and that sort of thing. Is that PR or lip service, or do you think they're really trying to find other things to do because the oil may be gone or it's, you know, we're dependent on, for, you know, or, or for instance, is the U.S. government, I mean, and I think after 9-11 there was mm -hmm. some concern, you know, are we being held hostage by the Middle East? We need to do something about this yeah. politically. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think you can... Again, you know, it's baby steps. We're looking at a trajectory. We're not looking at making the quantum leap in a day, but we do have to start the process. You can see where most of the, the money from the oil companies is going. There are 2,400 registered lobbyists for oil, coal, and natural gas companies in Washington, D.C. Now, figure those how many... Those are the registered those ones. Those are the registered ones, 2,400. Now, you know how many people we have in the House and the Senate. Yeah. So it, it, this is ridiculous. It's almost a 10 to 1 ratio. So it's very hard to be a lawmaker and have that kind of pressure constantly on you. Now, I think what we need to do is shift the focus, not just of the lawmakers, because we keep saying, well, it's the politicians, it's the politicians, it's the politicians. Hey, look, every time you pump, into your f every time you pump fuel into your car, you're voting. Every time you drive, every time you turn that ignition, you're voting. Every time you get on a bike, you're voting. I'm, so yeah, what I'm are you voting you for? We'll, we'll be right back. Why the heck? can't all of America's cars run on electricity and advanced biofuels. Why? When Detroit, they were shown that they would save millions of lives as they put seatbelts in their cars, they resisted it. And they didn't do it because they thought it was the morally right thing to do, which it was. They didn't do it until they were forced to do it by legislation. And we're in the same place right now. Consumers can choose to buy the Prius instead of the Hummer, and governments can choose to subsidize the Prius instead of the Hummer. And we are back with Peter Fonda and Josh DeKell, director of the documentary Fuel. Well, one thing you say in the documentary is that it's not just, well, people often say, you know, we only build these kind of cars because that's what people are buying. Right. Although now I don't know that the companies are practically bankrupt if they are making those cars. But, <laughs> but so what about, but I kind of buy that in a way with supply and demand. You know, it's like with drugs. You can say, oh my God, it's awful. People, if you're, if you're against, you know, drug use, you say, oh my God, it's awful. They're selling drugs. But then who's buying it? So, you know, people are buying these cars. Some people say, oh, well, it's because they spend a lot of money on advertising and so they're indoctrinating people. But what do you think? I mean, is it are both sides to blame got, in that yeah, equation? Yeah, I or? think you've got to be a conscientious objector. I yeah. mean, once upon a time we protested war. Once upon a time we took it upon ourselves to to channel the democracy and to make it go where we wanted it to go. And today, as I was saying, you know, when you turn your ignition, you vote. Mm -hmm. So, why vote for those 2,400 lobbyists that are constricting our democratic process? Why? Why every time you swipe that credit card at a gas pump, you're contributing to? They make a billion to two billion dollars a day in revenues from gasoline sales. We're talking about a lot of money. So 
I don't put my credit card into that machine. When I drive, I drive biodiesel. When Peter drives, he drives hydrogen. You're voting, your money is starting to move in a different direction. For every single person that does that, maybe it's not every single, maybe it's 10 or 100, there's one less lobbyist. There's one less lobbyist. There's one less lobbyist. And all of a sudden, it's not 2,400 lobbyists. It's 1,500, and then it's 500, and then it's 200. And then all of a sudden, all the green companies are crowding into Washington, D.C., going, hey, we need mandates. Yeah. Hey, we need goals. We need 2020. Yeah. No more gasoline like Sweden. And I think that's the transition. It's not going to happen in a day, but you got to get in and you got got to got to fight for it because that's well, the and, America. And that's what Peter was saying during the break too. You know, it's one step at a time. So what is the next step, Peter, in your opinion? Well, we continue doing this. Also, trying to feed ourselves in the film. It's uh, the uh, vertical gardens. Uh, there's the new trees. The three years they're grown. You cut off the limbs with the leaves. That becomes biofuel. And in three years, those same trees. You don't have to replant them more leaves. These are new, you know, hybrid plants, yes, but we're consciously doing things to give a, a, a better access to the, the system, to the fuel itself. As I said at the break, what's going to happen to all those huge oil refineries? What are they going to be refining? Nada. <laughs> it's, they're going to, and that's a hell of a thing to break. As you were saying, billions a day, that's a tough needle to pull out of somebody's arm. A lot of people were hoping that Obama would make a big difference with this. How do you think he's doing so far? Are we headed in the right direction? Is he doing enough or doing the right things? It's too early to say anything about President Obama's ability to pull this all off, but he certainly is into it. Um, he hasn't had enough time. There's so much. Um, we were talking about, do we have enough time here in the show to say what needs to be said? <laughs> right. And I said, well, it doesn't matter because this is a step. It's, it's a little step. There's three little steps today that we'll make that'll get people's attention. Obama's have, having the South Garden planted, uh, South uh, Lawn planted as a garden. That's a step. Mm -hmm. He'll probably put the uh, things back up on the solar panels, back up on the roof. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that will happen. But with what else is going on in the world with this incredible economy problem, the last thing I'm going to listen to and hopefully think he's, he's, on, he's on our side is whether or not he is for this. I know he's for it. It's when he gets to it, he's got so got much else to right deal with. Yeah. 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 He has a massive, massive. He does. So what do you think? He is, he, is he doing enough and doing the right things? I think he's trying. I think it's a David and Goliath situation. Mm -hmm. Even with somebody as visionary and powerful as he, we have to support him. You know, he's, he's one Obama and 2,400 oil lobbyists. <laughs> so there's got to be hundreds of thousands of us, which is really why, you know, we're, we're doing these shows and we're doing this yeah. media circuit to get people to go out to see fuel. Fuel has been consistently shunned by the big studios. It's been consistently pushed out of the movie theaters. And it, the reason is there's a lot of pressure to not see this movie. This is the movie that oil companies don't want you to see. This is the movie that the coal lobby doesn't want you to see. Right. This is the movie that could turn America into a green energy nation with a million new jobs within five years. So rally your theaters, get out there, get to the movie, get informed, because without information, they control you. Well, Peter, I can't have you here today and not ask you a little <laughs> bit about your acting career since you have the AFI uh, hat on. Um, I know besides your, your activism, and you've been raising hell for years, but I, you know, from Easy Rider to 310 Yuma, what, what's next for you? I know you've got several uh, projects in the I have house. Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day coming out. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the release of that. Two other films behind that, and I'm putting in a film together. I'm, I'm not doing it, I'm just part of it. That will be shot this summer. And this is all with the, the incredible bad things that are happening in the industry here, mm -hmm. and they're, they're awful too. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get algae actors. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm one of the lucky ones. I continue to work, uh, but I insist on it. And I think if we all insist on doing this and having a chance of doing one thing, it could happen in five years. If that's fast, but all the things we've just been talking about are already being done. You're gonna keep driving that hydrogen car. No, it's, you know, that's not it so much. I drive it because I want people to see alternate fuel. In the back it says uh, petroleum free. Mm -hmm. Just that, just alternate fuel. It's not necessarily hydrogen. It's not necessarily uh, the algae diesel, or actually algae fuel I prefer to call it, so it doesn't get confusing. Um, it's just there is alternative things we can do if we just commit to it. Well, thank you both very much, Absolutely, Josh DeKell, Director thank of Documentary Fuel. Us. Of course, Peter Fonda. Gregory. 
Thank you both. Keep giving them hell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.